so thank you everyone for being here. Um, my name's Brock. I'm gonna just kind of walk around and kind of show the room as I'm talking. Um, but we are part two collective, part two gallery, sorry. Um, we opened in March of 2018. Um, we focus on monthly exhibitions with local, international, and nationally based artists. Um, just really trying to do things a little differently than what we're all kind of used to in the art world. Um, you know, we have artist studios upstairs, so there's about 15 to 18 artists, uh, musicians, painters, photographers, animators, um, independent businesses upstairs that we uh, provide space to on top of our monthly programming. Um, and yeah, so we're just kind of this little culture hub of sorts in Oakland. Um, unfortunately, a lot of studios and galleries have been closing the past couple years. Um, it's really kind of nerve-wracking to think about what our community will look like in the next couple months with, um, you know, this virus kind of taking out a lot of small businesses and restaurants and places that a lot of people rely on um, for connection and creativity and for inspiration. Um, we're trying to do our best at the moment to keep our doors open and the studios open um, by, uh, you know, on top of our exhibitions that you we're going to talk about today uh, with the artists involved. Um, we've also started a series of online viewing rooms for artists that we are working with, um, have worked with and are interested in working with to provide, you know, some sort of relief. Um, a lot of people are caught off guard by this whole situation. Um, so we are currently working with, you know, a handful of artists again, locally, internationally, nationally based to uh, provide these more affordable works and things uh, that people are kind of making during their time of quarantine. Um, you can see that all online at part2gallery.com. There's a little tab called uh, online viewing room. Um, also, while we're doing this talk, if you are on the computer, you can definitely click, um, go to the website under the current folder. You will find um, Adrian's We Matter exhibition. Uh, you will find elements of exhibition. You will find self Reliance, Junebug's uh, solo exhibition. So you can actually scroll through and see some of the works we're talking about in person, along with layout images of the shows. And um, yeah, that's kind of my spiel. Um, uh, we can start with Adrian. Um, so I don't know how long ago it was, probably about eight months, if not longer, um, we talked about doing a solo exhibition. Um, and when we talked about wanting to do this um, we knew it was probably going to be the we matter series and at the time uh, i had been letting artists start to curate shows in our viewing room and i think what adrian thought is he was involved in one of those exhibitions and so when he had the opportunity to have the solo he also wanted to take the opportunity to curate a show and so that's what elements of became and um, yeah, so Adrian is also here with us today and kind of can also jump in and give some insight to what this is all for him as well. What's up, y'all? Thanks for joining all 100 whatever of you all. There's Jumba, looking like an old man. Um, but yeah, I... And really grateful to be here. Um, wish it was there in person, but this is the way of the world right now. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of background on myself. Uh, my name is Adrian Octavius Walker, based in Chicago, Illinois, uh, from St. Louis. Um, and my work mostly focuses on the black body uh, dynamics of the black family and archival work related work. Um, and basically just like storytelling in that way through uh, photography and also installation. And I touched on a little bit of um, performance work as well. Um, so We Matter is a body of work that I photographed back in 2018 in Oakland, California. Um, this work has been, man, pretty much like, uh, I can say my, my most solid work to date, I guess. Um, with the help from June Bug, a good friend of mine, Cameron, I had Michael as one of the uh, models. 
um, and my friend Paul. Um, this work pretty much started off as me photographing for the homies OG Royale with their Durex. And <clears throat> man, the photos just kind of like just changed. Like everything just changed. Like, I don't know, when I got the negatives back, I hit up Junebug. I was like, man, this is kind of crazy. You know, the work was just like, I, it just hit real different than just something to live on Instagram versus, and also like, in like a web store. And I pretty much talked to them. I told them like how I felt. And they was like, yeah, we get it. Like we're artists too. It's, it's perfectly fine. I was like, I'm going to give you all some photos for the work, you know, to promote the Durex and stuff like that. But I was like, I kind of want to sit on this work. And so from then, I pretty much like, you know, wrote up like a narrative. I had like a narrative behind the works. Uh, I got up with another friend of mine. His name is uh, Ryan Austin, and he's based in Oakland, California as well. And we just kind of went back and forth about like what these images mean to me and as well as him, kind of like what do they say uh, in different ways. And I came up with like, we matter. You know, we matter basically to me, you know, beyond just men and do rags, you know, it's, it, it was basically like an experience, you know, like for me, like shooting these photographs and the way they came out and also not knowing what I was going to do with the photographs. It was kind of like something where I listened to myself, like, like my past self was like, I'm going to make something and I'm going to actually sit on it for a long time. And basically when I got the work back and I wanted to get like some stuff printed, I got some stuff printed, seeing how it looked, printed it small, it didn't look right. Once I printed it large, you know, and I shot uh, a bulk of these with medium format and some like with 35. Um, but just basically getting that detail from like the images and seeing like the colors pop and everything. And it's like straight out of, out of the camera. You know, like I said, this was like a, a whole like cross-functional effort with uh, composition with like Junebug and Cameron's eye as far as like the whole setting of like the photos and pretty much how we like dress everything up. And uh, like, what I saw was like the intimacy with these photographs and how they were depicted uh, with these black men, you know, it's like, we're looked at as like a threat. And oftentimes we're assigned as like, we're a threat just based off of like what we're wearing, uh, particularly like a do-rag or something like that. When all actuality, we're just protecting our hair or we're just like wearing it, you know? I bet a bunch of us are wearing do-rags right now. Nobody can go to a barbershop, so we all looking crazy. Um, but at the same time, you know, I mostly wanted to challenge folks to basically look at these photographs and basically ask them what do they see, you know what I'm saying? And basically what I was seeing was blackness captured <clears throat> in a more profound way, uh, like just on a softer side, you know, a lot of these photos uh, show kinship in a way. Brock, if you can walk over to the power of kinship, that photo pretty much to me kind of tied everything together uh, with uh, literally, basically you see their, the do are tied together and they like more so connected. And so this is like, to me, like a sign of connectedness between two black men, whether they know each other or not. This is something that we all like relate to as far as like wearing a do-rag and also like the significance of that stems from basically us just being connected through things that we do in our everyday lives. You know, that's more so like how we take care of ourselves, what we wear, how we dress, what we put into our bodies, pretty much all of that in one kind of like brought this whole story together. And, you know, this work has seen a lot of great spaces. Uh, my first time showing this work all together was in Columbia, Missouri at the Greens. Uh, shout out to a good uh, friend of mine, brother Curtis Taylor Jr. He trusted me in this work and we pretty much like put everything together. And then that's pretty much how, what you see the installation came about in front of you. Uh, the installation, I called it Wave Check. And this is basically, looks like a black experience of what a black bathroom looks like. And I kind of like twisted things up when like, you know, 
the with the details and everything as far as like the hamper, like something usually hanging out of the hamper, whether it's a towel or something like that. Or, you know, I just put like the do rags there. And then over like when if you like look into <clears throat> look inside of the cabinet, you see all the things that we put in our hair from the like pink more pink oil moisturizer and Vaseline that we like put on our lips up. What else I have in there? Coconut oil, Murray's, Blue Magic, all these different things. You know, I just basically want to tell that story, you know. Even like the brush with the hair that's like little hair residue that's like on like the on the sink area or whatnot. And, you know, your mom like screaming at you, like clean the damn hair up and all that. So it's all this like detail I wanted to show. The, the cheap ass earrings from the uh, beauty supply house, you know, the ones that got your ear turning green, the oil, that's that's Barack Obama oil right there, y'all. That's not exclusively his, but that's what it's called. It's called the Barack Obama oil. $7 over on Webster Street in Oakland, you wanna get some. Um, and then like we put the country ass like wallpaper up also. Oh, Brock, I'm gonna get to that. We put the wallpaper up because you know like well I know in my bathroom like it's pretty crazy you know after a while like all of this usually like comes apart because all the steam and everything in the bathroom so it's just like kind of like tacky like who the hell put this up and it's kind of like been up for a long ass time nobody's like changing it and stuff like that but it's really like nostalgic you know what I'm saying like for me because this is exactly like kind of like how my bathroom looked like growing up you know and then like this part here was, oh, I think I lost Brock. Did we lose Brock? Oh, no, I'm good. Um, this part here, to me, like I put the toilet in. Um, and and when I first did this, we just had like the actual like vanity. But then I wanted to like put the toilet up. Well, Curtis, Curtis was like, hey, we should just go ahead and throw the toilet in there. I was like, all right, we're really going to do this. And so with that, you know, I put the inset on top of the toilet and like, you know, have that going on. Toilet paper, I really wanted to bring this experience to life because the type of artist I am, like I love going into spaces where I feel invited. And I also want to play a part. Uh, I want to play, play a part with the art. You know, I want to be able to touch things. So this is all interactive. You can touch it. You can just kind of like live the whole experience and be a part of it, you know, and I mostly like to challenge people like see how they feel or like rather or not like if this is something that they, how they saw like their grandma's home or their home or the house they grew up in. Mostly like it really like touched me in that way. And this is crazy. I didn't really peep this until um, a good friend of mine uh, took a photo of the, fo took a photo of the image that you see in the reflection. I didn't even like, pay attention to that but I was like damn that's tight as hell like because with all of this it's like we put it all together and then literally the night before or the morning like the morning before I'm like man we gotta we gotta call this show man this Rona out here fucking all of us up you know I hit up Junebug Junebug was half sleep this is something he did not want to hear Junebug is a lot like bad news at all he was like, man, we got to do this. We got to do this. I was like, I don't know. Like, this this shit is coming. And the fact that, like, we called it, you know, right before everything kind of hit off was kind of crazy because it's like uh, what we talked about was like we live in a history right now as artists. You know, we're all in we're dealing with such a crazy time, you know, the crazy time to be an artist. It's a crazy time to be alive. You know, this has changed everybody's life in some shape or form, whether you're like a parent, single parent, if you're together, uh, you work a nine to five. I work, I have a like a nine to five job. Um, and it was just crazy to like have this happen in such like timing because we put so much time into this, rather like we just talked about it. This is something me and June both like manifested from a long time ago. It was like, hey, we gotta have a show together. Or like me manifesting the fact that I wanted to play a part in part two gallery, you know, and then just like really getting connected with Brock and talking to Brock, it's like basically how can I show work in this space or just him believing in the work that I do and just like also with our whole collective, our entire collective nerd, you know, it's just like, this is like home base for all of us, you know? So it's just like, 
it's really like a nostalgic feeling, but then it's like, dang, now this happened in our community because, you know, being in Oakland or being a part of Oakland at the time, the four and a half years that I was there, I never really knew what community was. I say this all the time until I like moved to Oakland and it was like a sense of something I've never felt before. And so not being able to celebrate this moment with everybody, it really hurt, you know, it was something that we was not looking forward to at all. But then we have like this whole virtual space and being able to share our, you know, experience with this. And then like also for me, like showing works other places. Um, if you walk over to We Matter, uh, I mean, not We Matter, but if you walk over to Black Virgin Mary, for those who have been following me or whatnot, I am, uh, I was one of the prize winners for the 2019 Outwear Bouchover National Portrait Gallery. And this portrait here is um, hanging inside of the National Portrait Gallery at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. Uh, I would honestly say if it wasn't for June, I wouldn't have known about this uh, competition. Uh, it's something that we both applied, for, uh, applied to. And it was crazy that, you know, I typically like enter my work into a lot of things like monthly last year i was just like wow and just like every month just entering work entering work and it was no chance i would ever thought like something like that would happen so definitely one of those moments that i realized was like you know this art world this art thing is like it's it's real you know it's, it's been real but the fact that you know we can show up in these spaces and be a part of these spaces and when i say we i'm talking about black people you know us showing up in these spaces and being a part of these spaces and experiences like it's really real because it's something for us that we already feel like, well, I can't speak for a lot of people. We work really, really hard. And then to get into these spaces, you gotta like, you know, pull a lot of strings and you gotta kind of know somebody. So to have like a bunch of judges and people like that believe in this work and then to be in such uh, a, such a like amazing like space, like the Smithsonian, you know, that's something I never dreamed about. And so from there on, like, that's how I really knew, like, this work was like, really special. And also, if you are in Chicago, um, I'm showing about five uh, pieces from We Matter it's at the Hoxton Hotel in the West Loop. Uh, it's also closed down <laughs> right now, too. But whenever this blows over, I have work in Chicago and then also the works in Oakland, California. But, um, you know, like I said, having this work, in Oakland, you know, being able to share the experience is something like, like where I wanted to bring it back home. And also having it on the day, it was supposed to be on March 14th, and that's like 314 day in St. Louis, because, you know, a pie day, everybody else want to call it, but we celebrate 314 day as like an actual holiday. So the fact that this is going down in Oakland, 314 day, I have friends coming in from different places, wife flying in, and telling them literally like the day before, like, yo, you might as well just cancel your flight because we're about to, you know, uh, end the show. Or are we gonna call the show because we don't want so many people around, you know, due to this virus that's swelling around. It was just like kind of crazy, you know? It was just something to like really think about and sit back. And now it's just like, for me as an artist, I'm just trying to figure out different ways that I can show my work. Uh, and like different ways where I can like make sure that it is, you know, a part of like everybody's experience who wants to experience, whether it's like online or if it's just like show up at your doorstep or something like that. So I did have prints for sale, but sold out of those. Um, I do have a zine um, that I'm going to push back out. That's also another thing that got pushed out for us. It was LA Book Fair where we were supposed to show up there and I was going to have the zines there. But right now, like I said, this work, whenever this blows up, I don't know what our plans are, but, you know, just experiencing it and everybody saying it in person would, like, mean, like, the world. And uh, this is definitely my most proud work. And um, I just want to say thank you to Brock and uh, just part two, everybody who has, like, something to deal with this gallery and just everybody that's a part of the collective and everybody out there that's believing me as an artist, you know, I appreciate you all for buying prints, the retweets, the reposts, the likes, the comments, whatever, you know, cause like this is like the biggest body of work that I do have and uh, my most proud work. For those of you who aren't familiar with me, my name is Alain Fields. I am a photo-based visual artist um, living and working in New York City. Um, 
my two works, as you'll see um, in the gallery, are um, looking upon Black queer archives. Um, my practice involves the collection of found images of Black queer people, couples, individuals, scenes um, over the 21st century. Um, within those photos, I'm really thinking about what are notions of Black queerness that have been suppressed um, in the larger uh, collective of Black images. Um, we usually exist in kind of protest imagery and things of that sort, and I really wanted to take a step back and reinsert these images of Black queer leisure, which we um, unfortunately don't often enough get to interact with when thinking about um, Black queer, queer people um, prior to now, what did our ancestors look like, you know, when they were in play um, in the home space, um, fellowshipping. Uh, so with these two panels, these two pieces, um, Come With Me an Angel, which I'm looking at now, um, which we, we all are looking at now, and Crushed Velvet, which is to the left of this one. Um, we're really trying to get at shifting visibility, and you can see that with the wax and encaustic overlay and the doubling of the image and the tripling in the other. Um, but that I'm really thinking about what does it mean to be both hyper-visible as a Black queer person and invisible at the same time. Um, what parts of us are able to exist? Um, what parts do we have to kind of soften? I put these two images because I, I think we're not softening anything at all. I think what we're seeing is this kind of um, Black queer audacity that I'm searching for in the images that I collect, the, the found images that I collect. First of all, thank you, Brock. Appreciate this opportunity. Thank you, Adrian, for curating the show. Um, I guess I'll take it to um, where I started with my practice. And um, I started my practice, um, I'd say professionally as an artist, um, as soon as I moved to California from North Carolina. And then um, trying to find my voice as an artist, um, I found this reoccurring theme of being from the South and wanting to display the African diaspora. And um, my initial form of art was um, creating tapestry banners through the applique process and reclaiming cotton as this material of slavery and oppression from the South and using that to display my images and kind of like tying those both into the same narrative. And as I evolved as an artist, I kind of like moved into more of like multimedia. And um, so with this body of work, um, I was initially doing images uh, prior to these messages. And it was um, last year during a duo show with, um, uh, um, which was entitled um, um, Love Letters from a Runaway Slave. Uh, it was that theme that kind of gave me the push to start using text instead of just straight up images into my work. And uh, a lot of times I'll just have uh, this notes in my phone and I'll just enter little phrases that remind me of the South. And then uh, eventually it evolved into just phrases that explained or resonated with me about the African American experience. And so I thought it was like a nice segue into actually utilizing these phrases. And I just, um, I just really enjoy this font. It's like very bold and um, I just reuse it every time that I can. So it's just um, reiterating the same message and people can get the theme behind it. And, um, and then I guess it was later on last year that I had an opportunity to do a solo show in Portland, Oregon. And then um, I decided to run with this idea a little bit stronger and just make it a little bit bigger and um, adding the, the arrow element at the very top for the notes, just kind of just like brought it all together. Um, the meaning behind just 
the arrows rather than just the paper itself displaying the message is that a lot of my work is inspired through um, American traditional tattoos and just that image and that uh, iconic feel and just how classic it is and how bold it is. I just really resonate with those images. And um, so a lot of times cherubs are used throughout uh, American traditional uh, tattoos. And um, I just really enjoy the conversation of tying in my work initially being from um, the transatlantic slave trade and this transportation of a large body of people across this um, across the ocean and then also tying that same uh, experience into this naval uh, iconography and also like the transportation of people across this large body of water and yeah so just tying it all into this kind of just like love letters from the south and um just evolving it into more phrases and quotes um so if you don't belong here don't be long here um that just speaks of being from the south and perhaps experiencing or um talking with people that don't necessarily resonate with you and then it's just like you just get this vibe where you just gotta like okay it's i can't can't be here long so I just got a dip and it's just is what it is and um beside that one is an eye for an eye now everyone's blind um it just talks about or it just speaks to the the constant rotation of, of violence and that happens on both sides and just how things probably will never uh end up evening out it's just um you just retaliate and then somebody else retaliates and then that constant cycle and then leading to everybody being blind. And um, and these a lot of these quotes or phrases, they kind of, they start and they maybe don't have an end or they have like different meanings as time goes on. And um, I guess the last one to the far left, hello darkness, my old friend. Um, this one kind of means like multiple things to me. Um, um, initially kind of like dealing off of um, battling um, perhaps like moodiness or depression and also hello darkness my old friend just um, it can also be kind of that reminder sometimes when you go out and you have those experiences um, where um, somebody reacts to you based off your race and it's just like it just like clicks like it's, it's that constant reminder of the skin that you have to wear around and so it's kind of like hello darkness my old friend is just like that constant reminder of who you are and um and then framed off on both sides of that are the two cherubs that are typically displayed within the um, um american traditional tattoos and kind of just flipping that into my style and just continuing that image and having fun with it I'm Angela Hennessy. Uh, I'm here with Tahira Rashid, and uh, we did this See Black Women text uh, gold leaf on black paint. Um, I am an artist and a professor at California College of the Arts, and I teach classes on uh, the relationship between death and art, and looking at how artists respond to death and grief and loss through their aesthetic and somatic practices. Um, and I teach a lot of classes on textile theory as well and thinking about uh, how textiles are non-hierarchical -hier structures. Um, so that is kind of a lot of that uh, is the foundation of my work. Um, these pieces that we're looking at right now are from uh, a big kind of table piece that I did at the Museum of the African Diaspora last year. There's actually the, the full set, there's nine pieces in the full set. Um, you can see right here, there's little hand carved uh, ivory soap uh, beads down at the bottom. Um, I, I primarily work with black materials, often hair, but other black materials as well. And, thinking about also how the context of the gallery 
you know, that are often white box kind of spaces. So part of the motivation in my work is inserting uh, blackness, ideas of blackness into white spaces. And some, you know, I've also, of course, like as the wall here and the Sea Black Women wall, we painted that wall black. So all of those, um, all of those decisions are really intentional in looking at uh, hierarchies and dynamics of race through color. Um, and the, yeah, so just, you know, those small pieces were um, part of a set called Black Oracles. Um, and those are really kind of building off of ideas of uh, African sculpture, um, kind of, you know, unidentified uh, representations um, and uh, looking at the way that hair mediates these relationships um, between living and breathing bodies and dead or dying bodies. Um, hair is often one of these materials that is exchanged between the living and the dead. So that has been something that, uh, that I've, you know, uh, you know, I'm using to signal that relationship. Um, yeah, so what else? The sea, I want to come back to the sea black women uh, wall and give T a chance to talk about it. Um, just briefly a little bit of background. Um, it's a collaborative, collective project uh, that came out of the San Francisco Arts Commission, uh, the monument that was supposed to go in at, or that is still happening, it's still happening, um, at the San Francisco Public Library that was a tribute to Maya Angelou. And I was one of the panelists on the uh, selection panel. And um, yeah, I don't know how to say it, but uh, basically they dismissed the nomination of the selection panel and what has come out of that has been a collective response from a bunch of uh, uh, black women, women X artists, primarily in the East Bay in Oakland. And uh, so this is sort of, this is part of that project. It's a series of actions. Um, we did a big thing at Black Joy Parade. We're doing some activations. Uh, and so just thinking about, you know, what, is, what does it even mean to say, see black women, you know, on a wall in gold text that, you know, is also kind of doing something with the eye, you know, because like if you look from certain angles, it starts to disappear. So we wanted to um, just sort of, uh, you know, have an opportunity to, uh, to put that into another context as well. Right. My name is T. Rashid. I'm from Oakland, California, West Oakland. Um, Angela and I are partners and collaborators, and as she said, uh, the beginnings of Sea Black Women came out of the Artist Commission's response to uh, the, the dismissal of the labor of Lava Thomas. Um, I am an activist and entrepreneur. I work for Critical Resistance. Um, it's a national grassroots organization um, consisting of abolitionists and uh, raised and based off of Black queer feminist theory, and um, see black women is uh, ties very much so into the thematic um, title of we matter, and it's a question of who matters and how black women don't matter, and the hyper invisibility of black women actually then ends up um, invisibilizing black women, and so these statements um, see black women in the eye chart that we also have in addition to that, um, which is on a billboard in San Francisco, um, ties into that uh, Ashara Akindayu, who, is, uh, who previously had a gallery in West Oakland is also a part of this collective. And we work <coughs> um, to highlight and give um, a platform for black women as um, they often seem to not matter. We often seem to not matter, especially in these current times and um, consistent with COVID-19 and coronavirus right now, um, a lot of these, you know, black people on the front lines are black women. A lot of these grocery workers register, people at the register, at the cashier, you know, bagging, driving these trucks are black women. And, it, you know, it's a question of do you, do, do folks actually see black women? So that is the, the purpose and intent of putting that statement up in gold. 
and gold leaf, which is, which has value. Um, um, the price of gold goes up and down every day. And that's why we use that specific material um, with insight from Angela and working with textiles on using gold, gold leaf because it has value. So putting the statement of see black women with gold leaf that has value because we want to send the message that black women matter. We do also matter and would like to be included um, in every aspect. And part of our mission statement is see black women, listen to black women, trust black women, and of course pay black women. And protect. And protect black women. And uh, we wholeheartedly believe that and would like that to be um, seen globally. And that is our intent behind um, both the color, as Angela said, and how she works with color um, and using gold leaf, giving value to black women. My name is Linworth McIntosh. Um, I go by Junebug. Most people know me by Junebug from Jamaica originally, and um, I've traveled quite a bit away from home. So uh, I lived in Texas most of my life, in Florida, and then now I'm in the Bay. I've been here about five years and living in West Oakland currently. Um, and so I've created some um, characters that I feel um, are my ways of personifying my perceptions of the world. Um, and I have these characters that I work on uh, daily and they, as I grow, they grow. Um, and the character that I use for this show um, is simply just called Man Wearing Hat, a very literal um, description of a man wearing hat. But in that, simplified title is a complex uh, person and it's he represents a lot of my adult uh, eyes to the world and um, I see him as a person that is aware of his surroundings but is a, on a constant um, internal strife on figuring out how he fits into this world and how he defines himself based on his experiences, based on how he looks, um, based on what's already intact in society and historical um, trajectories and timelines. And so with this show, um, I call it self-reliance um, because it is a way for me to look at the exterior but from an interior perspective and realize that a lot of my internal dialogues or my gut reactions or my conscience if you will um, are a direct um, gateway for me to understand what I perceive on the outside and a lot of us have these internal dialogues um, you know constantly and it has been a focus for me just to try to understand and try to listen um, to my internal dialogue and really appreciate that that is a reoccurring thing. Um, and then how do I take that concept and like put it into pieces that resonate with other people? Because at the end of the day, I feel like we're all a part of some larger body of consciousness. Um, and so I feel like we're all connected. And so a lot of my art is more so about creating the, 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 the things that I see um, and putting them on tangible um, canvases, but not necessarily dictating how the person should receive it or understand it. And it's more of like my observation um, that I'm constantly like internally having uh, to digest and understand. Um, and then hopefully it being a collaboration of what I'm digesting 
and putting forth and then based on whoever is viewing it and their experience of what they've digested and what they've come to understand is now being basically put to the test and meeting but internally as you're reading something on a canvas um, so a lot of these pieces uh, we can probably start with um, Moondog's monologue um, which is the uh, there we go which is the the anchor piece I think for the show um, and it was one of my pieces that I really enjoyed um, growing with um, and oil painting is fairly new to me and I've been you know acrylic for so long and illustration with a pencil and pen for even longer and so there was a lot of growth in me understanding and being comfortable with working with a medium like oil because um, it is it is very much of a, a different approach and uh, as much as I've drawn this character it was still difficult to like figure out how to place him on this canvas and one being larger than my usual so he is more of in a thinking space on the canvas and what i wanted to really um, bring forth was this somewhat thinking space and almost bring the viewer into his mind of what he's like having this moment of thinking space and so like having um, the dialogue where he's kind of looking at the bulk of his life and looking at or reminiscing on things that he believed when he was younger and how he's coming to different experiences and how that's changed and almost trying to figure out if he moved on or is he stuck or is there something that he's trying to shake and you know his belief system is too strong in the old ways for him to shake that um, so I was actually listening to this track called Moondog's Monologue by this artist named Moondog. And <clears throat> the track is basically him having a dialogue um, and almost like this um, just riff of internal thoughts. Um, and they're almost like, um, they're almost going against each other as he's saying them over a melodic beat but i took that and when i was listening to it I, it made me think and so i was thinking okay if i'm thinking about my own experiences based on just these little gems that this person is dropping on the song then putting you know the the title of the piece um is an ode to the song but what's on the uh, actual piece is just the words that say um, the error of my ways is subjected to the nature of my perception, and almost as this. Uh, did we lose Brock? I don't know if we lost Brock, but uh, we there lost we Brock. Oh, there he is. Okay. Um, so yeah, the error of my ways is uh, subjected to the nature of my perception, as if saying uh, what I perceive and what I think is wrong is only wrong for a certain amount of time until I come across something that may change that or may make me see the bigger picture um, than what I'm used to. And so it goes back to even when um, I moved to the States from Jamaica and a lot of things that I understood to be the right way about my life um, quickly changed because I was now in a new space with a new uh, body of people and new norms that I wasn't accustomed to. And so adapting to those and understanding those, um, pairing with what I used to know um, quickly changed. And so I think we are always doing that, but we are always not necessarily paying attention to the details of such changes. Um, and it's usually only when things go to an abrupt um, height and then we're forced to change at that moment and then we realize that something is actually happening but most of the change always occurs naturally and almost involuntarily um, so yeah the the piece was really about that and even creating the piece there was a lot of um, the process of <clears throat> thinking like 
this was going to look a certain way and then halfway through it just looks different and choosing to accept that or choosing to stick to what i had originally in plan and there's pieces of it that still stuck but there are certain beauties that kind of happen naturally in the growing process of it so i think this piece was more about the growth and letting go of certain perfections or certain projections that i had um, for what the finish to look like <clears throat> and then i thought about it would be cool to just have this character physically in the space and so i got with a friend um, delilah who's able to give me the opportunity to bring and style the man wearing hat into the space and have it be more of an interactive so when people walk in you know uh, which was the intended plan um was to just like see the painting and then see a, a physical manifestation of the painting and the character itself and kind of having this autonomous uh no head on the mannequin we figure out a way to kind of keep that same feel and with the hat floating above almost like implying you know the face could be anybody and essentially the man wearing hat is a lot of people in a lot of different time uh eras and so it's kind of these problems are still able to exist uh, from different places and so it's like what do you do in the 60s what do you do in the 80s what do you do you know in the here and now and this man wearing hat has existed in all of those phases of time and he's been black in all of those phases of time and he's always had these certain struggles whether it's external or internal um and i think we can go to the next few pieces um these first sets are prints from a, a lino cut that i did um and basically carving a linoleum i first drew um the the man wearing hat covering his face. And that was from a photo that I had saw on Instagram. And um, it really inspired me of just kind of this almost um, shameful, but at the same time could mean um, kind of hiding or shielding away from what's going on, on the outside. Um, and initially when I came up with the concept of the show, it wasn't called self-reliance. Um, it had to do a lot more with the nature of sin and studying um, what we perceive to be a sin and how it's only based on what we understand and how we could see someone as evil, but then someone else could see that same person as, you know, the epitome of good. Um, and we both could be right and we both could be wrong at the same time. Um, and so me growing up in Jamaica and still having a colonial tie um, because we got our independence in 62 and then there's still remnants in architecture and religious strongholds on the whole island. So there's a lot of like deeply rooted, um, strong religious ties. And so growing up in the church, you know, it was difficult for me to understand uh from the perspective of seeing uh, a blue-eyed blonde jesus and then going home to a rastafarian cut uh depiction of black christ on my walls um which you know in initially like started that internal dialogue for me you know i was like three or four so i think ever since then i've kind of questioned the belief system of religion um, versus personal experiences um, and so with this it's saying please hide me lord and the title is called sinner man and actually i was listening to the nina simone song uh sinner man and that really spoke to me and the energy in that song uh was really inspiring and i imagined um me as a kid um being god fearing and questioning what that really meant um, because there's the duality of loving God and then at the same time fearing God and um, always understood that to be this contradictory thing. Um, so we have the man wearing hat 
uh, asking to be hidden as if um, he's done a shameful thing. Um, and then behind him, what I thought would be, you know, a hail fire or the end of the world apocalypse kind of thing, or just like this nightmarish um, element to it could have been like something where he's more so trying to shield from emotions or shield from the guilt of believing in something, but not necessarily knowing if that's right or wrong to go against what he's been taught. Um, and going to this one is um, it's called Exhibit A, and it's kind of showcasing this um, kind of like, uh, hello, here we are doing this again, um, time and time again. You know, we're kind of um, showcasing the struggle, we're showcasing the protest, we're showcasing the fight, um, and we're showcasing all these different facets of the Black experience. Um, and we're repeating a lot of these things because in some cases we're heard, but at the same time quickly forgotten. And so we have to keep reiterating these struggles, reiterating the fight, um, reiterating the reason why we are in this predicament that we are in, um, and the reason why we're a complex uh, set of people and how historical things have put us in a certain place in time. And it's always something of a, a battle. Um, but in the same time, where there's a lot of love and there's a lot of affection shown within our community. Um, and it's not always just a black and white um, killing of each other or um, supporting each other. There's a lot of gray space in between. And we as a people can be a lot of things. And it's just a matter of like, showing you time and time again, you know, whether that's to through um, feats and athleticism, uh, academia, arts, there's, there's something that's always being shown. And it, it's something I, I, I think I think about a lot where it's just, we, like at, at some point, when are we going to desert the need to um, showcase go above and beyond, you know? And I think this piece was something along those lines that I wanted to explore. Um, he's cross-eyed because he's a little confused. And I, I think I draw a lot of that where my eyes are usually cross-eyed or dead on center where it's a deep gaze or kind of confused. Um, and I like to explore those two different gazes because they're both about what's going on internally. Um, but what you see on the outside is a little different. Um, and going to the next piece, um, it's called Come On In, The Fire Is Warm. And this was also another lino cut. Um, a bit more uh, detailed and uh, graphic. Um, it's the man wearing hat as, as if he, completely accepted the societal uh, implications of who he was, the stereotypes of who he is as a black body and the fears that are centered in society or cemented in society through different media groups and um, ignorance. And so he's completely succumbed to the rage, completely succumbed to you know, this is what you made me out to be, so here I am. Um, he completely succumbed to um, being as violent as you make him out to be. Um, and so there's this almost hellfire that he's standing in front of with a machete, which is another ode, like his setup is an ode to um, Jamaica in a way of like how I was raised on the rural side of Jamaica, so a lot of my friends and family like grandparents um they were more so of the farm so they would dress up in these rubber boots and you know have the pants tucked in and with the machete shirt off because jamaica's hella hot so it's there's a certain uh nostalgic item of just remembering how we would go dress up to go to the bush and basically farm um, but at the same time there's this slavery mentality um, and 
you can't help but not look at his piercing eyes um, and then mixing that with the fire. And it just kind of forms this imagery that I think is been in the back of people's minds um, in, in a sense of like globally. Um, and it's, it's almost uncontainable amount of fire and fear um, because it's just like a wildfire really. Uh, once it was set, it just went viral and it's never really stopped. Um, and so even the severed heads on the ground, you know, it's both white and black. Um, but what I like about it, the piece is that although it's about destruction, there's two flowers that are intact that weren't damaged by the fire. And it kind of shows this balance of as much as things have gone off the rails, there's still a little beam of hope. Um, and in a lot of my works, there's always a certain balance, whether it's just one object or a color. Um, my life has been about balance, about finding the balance and less about the extremes of one side or the other. Um, and going towards the next piece, um, I put this piece next to uh, Come On In The Fire Is Warm um, because just even looking at it now, it gives me some sort of um, idea of what the black man would be like coming out of um, slavery or like going into the next stage of um, pacification of the black image or um, this kind of oversight or this overlooking of the trauma that was bred in a certain time period and then how that trauma is almost overlooked as like a get over it but not necessarily in those words but more so like um, a forgotten memento of like if like the the trauma that has been experienced is almost invisible um, unless it's within the person itself and so you might see items of alcoholism you might see items of domestic abuse where it on the outside it just looks like um, that's the norm but I think on the inside there's a certain battle going on and there's a certain fire that's still raging that hasn't been um, put out or that hasn't been even addressed. It's just been masked over by different vices. And so you have the man wearing hat walking forward. And I, I put 1968 um, because that, you know, the civil rights era was going on at that time. Um, and a few uprisings, a few fires. And um, he's drinking alcohol, which is only making the fire larger. Um, but again, there's that balance behind him of the shadow um, kind of cooling the fire that's going on inside of him. Um, and he's walking forward, and there's still a little bit of fire on his pants leg, um, but he is still walking forward. So there's like a little bit of hope that as he keeps progressing, you know, eventually either the fire will quench or it will grow larger. Um, but there's opportunities in the future for him to um, reach a sense of calmness uh, or state of calmness. Um, and then moving forward to spiritual jazz. Um, actually, these three photos kind of feel like a timeline almost because um, there's destruction and then they're coming out of destruction and there's like a place where you are experiencing this joy, um, but then at the same time, you're experiencing joy on the outside finally, um, but then on the, or in the, on the inside finally, but on the outside, you still have this certain um, scope about you. Um, so having my friend Adu, which I shot this photo and it's a darkroom development photo, as well as a darkroom print, um and he was genuinely uh he was genuinely laughing 
and um, I just happened to catch him at this mid laugh moment. And he just has a huge persona and a huge smile, and he's just a very energetically um, guy that just has an addicting laugh, right? And so you know when a dude's in the room. Um, and I purposefully brought a lot of the the shadows down so it would just be the teeth that you would see um, and the bust um, so the two buttons which is usually how I draw the man wearing hat uh, as a bust um, it's just his head a shirt two buttons and a tie um, and so it's kind of reminiscent to one of the drawings but at the same time there's a lot of um, darkness in it um, but at the same time, there's lightness in it. And so it's that duality of existing as just a laugh to me, but then the viewer, based on what they have experienced, um, where that been, you know, growing up or just experienced, you know, as an adult, um, whatever that case may be, they may see it differently. They may see it as a maniacal laugh. They may see it as still a genuine laugh. Um, or they just might just see a dark, figure on a wall um, but it's more about just this figure experiencing joy and I think about spiritual jazz and I think about um, just kind of the ancestral spirit that lives on through generations and how jazz has always been a, a medium that is less about words and more about the spiritual energy and how that can infect and um, kind of live inside people and move from person to person in a way of um, uh, releasing a lot of stress and trauma. Um, and so he might just be basically releasing a lot of that trauma that he has been progressing towards. Um, and then moving on to this next one. Um, there's a, a guy sitting in front of a computer or sitting at a desk um, and it's called Computer 404 and um, when I when I uh, drew it uh, it's a lot of mediums actually it's um, watercolor, color pencil a little bit of oil a little bit of acrylic um, graphite and um, it's him sitting at a desk and when I drew it, I wasn't really knowing exactly where we would go. I just took it and ran with it. Um, so there's a lot of mistakes in it, but utilizing those mistakes as part of the final product was important. And once I finished it, it just sat in a drawer. But then when I revisited, trying to come up with the show concept, it worked for a lot of reasons um, because it, it felt like there was the flower in the back was some sort of um, element of uh, a higher consciousness and that tying to nature and that tying to us as humans and how we can become too much in our heads a little bit and needing some sort of download from um, the outside um, and so he's kind of like inside the space but there's an element of nature and there's an element of a higher um, conscious that he's getting a lot of his memories, a lot of his um, emotions from. And not all those emotions I feel are as jubilant as we may think they are gonna be. Um, and so it has the ability to unearth a lot of traumas. And so he's kind of experiencing a shotgun of downloads. Um, and there's the nod to whenever you go to the wrong browser and you get the computer 404 error. Um, and so it also ties into the whole self-reliance show of just experiencing error and then seeing the error as, is it an error really right now because of how I'm perceiving it or is it just having experienced something that makes it feel like this is what's supposed to be happening anyway. Um, and so there's a level where he's going to accept what's being downloaded and utilize that to actually heal himself. Um, 
And so he's just kind of like sitting at this desk, kind of contemplating how to understand what's being downloaded. Um, And there's like a raw emotion of just shedding a tear, which I feel a lot of uh, notions about black men is like, they don't cry or just men in general don't cry. But um, that happens a lot more than is perceived. And the idea of what a man should be doing is very subjective. And so I always choose to include some sort of softness in the work, especially when it comes to men. Um, And I don't fashion myself as a machismo guy. So I want to create things that resonate with me because I feel like they resonate with someone else that feels the same way. Um, And so I guess we can move on to the other piece. Uh, This was an important piece I had thought about for a while. And um, it's kind of nice that it's directly across from Moondog's monologue. Um, Because while you have Moondog's monologue having an internal dialogue, you also have the character having a mask as a buffer, but staring intently into the mirror at himself, trying to figure out his internal dialogues. Um, and so I included him in a chair versus him standing up because it occurred to me, like, if you are standing up, looking at a mirror, you're not there very long, you know, but if you sit in a chair, there's a certain intention that you have because you're comfortable and you, you are essentially in the perfect position to stare for a longer period of time. Um, And so it feels like he's been there a while when I put him in the chair. And if you've stared at yourself, I know I have, if you stared at yourself long enough in the mirror, there are a couple things I've found that happens. And one of those is like you stare hard enough, you almost start to see inside of yourself Um, because I think when us as humans stare at a reflection, uh, for long enough, there's a certain, uh, there's a certain, um, kind of feeling that you get staring into yourself. It almost feels like there's an infinite amount of you. So you're almost like seeing different personalities the longer you stare. You're almost seeing memories. Um, And that concept always fascinated me because I'm playing out things in real time as a video, but only I'm able to see them. And I'm seeing these infinite doors open. um, And it's almost like a way for me to enter into my own consciousness. Um, And there's a a certain level of meditation to that. And for this person sitting in the chair, it's almost as if he's using the mask as protection because he's scared of what he might find um, staring for so long. And utilizing the the African-esque mask. um, And then, you know, there's, there's a lot of nostalgic elements to the mask being wood for me because there's a lot of carving of masks in Jamaica. And anyone who's been to Jamaica has seen like the roadside um, people that carve masks and sell them. Or like if you've entered any Caribbean islands or home, there's usually like some sort of mask element to it. Um, And so he's staring intently um, because he's trying to figure out his internal dialogue. And I just thought it'd be nice to just have an imagery to someone in real time trying to figure out what they're thinking um, and then almost feeling like they're losing grip on reality because they've been staring so long. Uh, And so it was really important for me to just create something like that or just to give that element uh, for someone to think about later. Um, And I approach a lot of the work like billboards. So if you come across a billboard and you drive past it, a good billboard will have you thinking about it all the way home. Um, and you might not figure it out until you go to sleep. So it's kind of one of those things where a lot of these pieces are meant to be thinking pieces. 
and are meant to not give you the full scope of it, but allow you to come to that conclusion based on your own experiences. Um, and then moving on to the next wall, um, this was a bit of how I am uh, in general and a little bit of nostalgic uh, nods to my upbringing in Jamaica. Um, it's called The Peppermint Witness and um, it's a lot of what I do on a daily basis is just observe and being a witness to a lot of um, moments in time, a lot of uh, concepts that are playing themselves out. Um, a lot of uh, my diet is about observation, it's about curation, um, reading different books, watching different shows, cartoons, like everything has been um, a fascination of observation for me. And shooting street photography is really my best way of observing the world around me um, because I get to walk and I get to see things and I am able to have tangible evidence of these moments that I've come across um, for my own personal gain. And so there's the idea of peppermint being uh, a scent that is able to take me instantly back to my childhood. And I find it fascinating that through our senses, especially the sense of smell, uh, we can be transported to any given time period that we first came into contact with that. And there's a certain level of triggering that happens where it could take you back to a place that's great, take you back to a memory that's not so great. Um, but that instant transportation is a real thing. Um, and so having this person kind of embodying both the nostalgic triggering and a way from me to like function as far as like observing the world. So I am able to see, therefore I'm able to create um, and then these next, these last three pieces, um, the two on the, the, the middle one was done last year. The other two were done uh, two years ago for another show. And um, the, I guess we'll talk about the middle one first, Brock. Um, <clears throat> so this piece has to do with um, the early idea of the show which was about sin and religion and like trying to understand that context and the duality um, and the concept of sin and like, how does that look outside of the religious context? Um, and is it just a good or a bad thing? So this was done with um, color pencils and it's called, um, I think, pink in the negative space. And again, going with that balance um, of inserting softness into uh, a very masculine and um, aggressive picture. Um, and I say aggressive because if the context of what black represents um, from the outside um, and how it has affected my experiences um, or added to my experiences growing up and being seen black first and then here comes the fear right after that um, and then the nature of seeing black as sinful and um, the white as um, this kind of like angelic cleanliness um, was something that I used to think about because a lot of my cartoon inspirations growing up, a lot of the, the danger and a lot of the, um, the evil or the bad guy was always just a little darker than the good person or the, the protagonist was always a lighter complexion or had a brighter glowing light. And the antagonist was always like in this darkness or shrouded in the shadows or um, even, even the aspect of the antagonist being much, much smaller than the protagonist but being black and the fact that this small thing being black trumps the big thing being uh, good and white was something that I thought was very interesting um, because it was no longer about size, it was just the impact of the color black. Um, and I think over time, when you are hit with so many of those subliminals growing up, 
when you reach adulthood, you start to like reflect on those. And I know some of y'all watch the Disney movies. And if you rewatch Disney movies, a lot of those movies are subliminal. And a lot of old cartoons are very subliminal and most of it portrayed the black as the evil. Um, and um, so I wanted to create something where it was just a, a little sliver of pink in the negative space. And the negative space in this case is the black. Um, and it's kind of a, a double entendre in a way. Um, the other two images uh, kind of go hand in hand with each other, I feel. Um, because it talks about the trajectory of what uh, generational um, uh, expectations are um, for the black male. And so you have the apple doesn't fall far from the tree in the sense of if, you're, if your pops went to prison and his grandpops went to prison, then chances are you're next on going to prison. And then once you're in prison, your offspring is probably going to end up at some point in that same space. And so it was like this apple prematurely being um, not necessarily plucked, but cut from a tree and then falling um, over a barbed wire fence. Um, but he's not ready, in a sense, to fall over that place. It's just kind of the wind blows him, you know, the 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 theoretical um, pipeline system of a wind uh, has blown him into this space that he's prematurely not ready for um, and put into this um, kind of flow of things that has been predetermined based on the generation that came before him. Um, and so that, that I think uh, when I did that show it was about the the prison system and the the justice system in America, and how a lot of the things that are in play are also a part of the leniency of the American people, um, because at some point uh, the things that are going on in the in the prison system also affect the people, and sometimes the people affect what's going on as well. Um, so we we have cognitive dissonance about the atrocities that go on. Some of us fight it, um, and some of us are aware of it, but do nothing about it. And some of us are aware of it, and but don't feel like we can do anything about it. And there's so many layers to that. Um, and I wanted to create some sort of, um, or shed some sort of light on that. And I don't claim to know everything there is to know about the justice system and the prison system, but I have understood it to be some sort of projection um, based on generational and historical um, timelines of people in the Black position. Um, and the other piece that goes with this one um, is called I Got You. And it's kind of like the, the man wearing hat in this piece is like the man um, in 1968, um, where he's coming up out of, uh, he's like a second class citizen at this point, right? So he's gone to prison, he's come out, um, but he's still on surveillance, right? And so he's trying to raise his offspring, um, which is represented by this plant. Um, and as he's trying to do his best, he still has a lot of trauma that he has to um, heal from. And in a lot of cases, most black men don't have a lot of time to heal from the trauma because they're busy raising the next generation. Um, and so I wanted to like really dive into that. Um, his eyes are a bit hollow, um, which is like a symbolizing of the trauma has yet to be healed. Um, and he's kind of in this dingy state. Um, so he's still feeling a lot of grief. He's still feeling a lot of um, kind of guilt from missing out on life and missing out on um, a family structure, um, being a pillar at the head of the household, um, to now being 
someone that is new to the world in his adult stage um, and still trying to raise uh, a kid and like tell him how the world is still, you know, a certain way and how to prepare for that without him still trying to prepare for himself. Um, so it's like a broken man trying to create um, a better life, um, but at the same time, still trying to fix himself um, simultaneously. Um, so I think that's it for all these pieces. Um, yeah, uh, the show is really um, just an exploration, uh, which I, I think a lot of art for us is, um, but diving into different ideas of perception for the black male was important and still is important. And I feel like as time goes and the more I come into knowledge, um, these depictions will change um, and the man wearing hat will still remain the same because it's, he's much as a living and breathing uh, character as I am. And so he is not perfect, he is flawed as we all are. And there's a certain sense of remembering that we are all flawed and we are able to be right and wrong. Um, and we're able to progress forward based on the mistakes that we've made. Um, and it's imperative that we look within ourselves and rely on our ability to problem solve and rely on our ability to have this internal dialogue and figure stuff out to be able to progress forward. What's up, y'all? This is Jumani. Um, yeah, my, my first question is for Tia and Angela. Um, I love your work. I love the See Black Women piece. Um, and yeah, the piece feels very um, bold and powerful, even though it can be perceived as, as minimalist. Um, and I'm just curious about the intentionality behind things beyond the goal, right? Like using all caps, the black wall canvas, the positioning of the words, and if you could speak a little bit more to that. Yeah, thank you for that question, Jumani. Um, we definitely worked really hard to unpack the intersectional experiences of race and gender um, pertaining to the Black woman's experience and the Black woman's body. And I started, I started jotting down notes. And then we wanted to basically demonstrate the need for um, the intersections between um, feminism and leisure studies. And that is like the play on the black bold wall, the gold leaf, the all caps. Um, I know that, you know, last year Angela had a show um, with the title of Where Am I Enter? Um, which I think speaks to exactly what you're asking in that question and how we explored um, and critiqued the two juxtapositions of positioning black women in leisure um, with invisibility and hyper visibility. Would you like to speak yeah, to that? I think too, I mean, the point about minimalism and like using all caps and bold text and all of that, I mean, that's something that I'm really interested in in terms of like, you know, what are the formal structures that, uh, that become a language, right? So if I'm communicating in a minimalist language versus a Baroque language, right? Mm -hmm. Like those are two very different aesthetics. But there's also like, I'm really interested in deception in terms of, of in terms of what is presented, like, you know, do I lay everything out for you in terms of my story? Like, uh, Jordy just mentioned something about taking a bullet and I'm someone who has actually taken, a bullet, taken a bullet, right? And so that is a specific experience for me. But there's like all these ways that we use language to veil certain things or to suggest something or we use, you know, these metaphors that also have like real everyday lived somatic experience. And so the layers that are used to veil information 
that, that's something that I'm interested in in my work. And so the fact that the work that, you know, this big black wall with, you know, just one line of text, right? And we actually had intended, you know, we had this whole big crazy thing that we had intended to do, and then it just kind of kept getting scaled back. And um, so in a way, it does, it does feel kind of minimal compared to where we had started, you know, with like the evolution of, of the wall. Um, but, you know, there's something too about like, you know, how much can a page hold? How much can a wall hold? So like how if you write a poem, body? yeah, how much can a black body hold, right? So black if you write a body. poem and you have all this blank space and you just have three words, like that could fill up the whole space, right? Those three words could fill up the whole wall. And thinking about like the weight of, you know, what does that empty black space do? Like, yeah, it might appear as being minimal, but there's hella shit going on there. There's and what is hella shit and what does that black there. space appear to do um, historically in Eurocentric um, uh, modeling of arts and you know museums and how art is shown with a white wall and what that means to have a black wall with gold depicting and asking folks to visualize without hyper visualizing black women with gold leaf. Um, it was very intentional for us and um, we appreciate that question and highlighting that and bringing that out. Thank you very much. Did we answer your question? Yeah, thanks y'all. Yeah, I really loved your points around just like unveiling deception, right? And how just like black women and our bodies, we've we have and always uh, have been going through a lot of shit and we don't have to dress that up, right? We can be raw about that. Um, it could be one line. Right. Yeah, I had a few um, other questions. One was, yeah, bringing us back to the gold. Um, can you talk a little bit more about just the historic relationship between gold and the black female body? Yeah. Um, I, you know, my work with gold began, you know, like, I guess when I was in high school and started doing metal work and making jewelry and um, <clears throat> someone gave me, I think I was about 13, someone gave me a copy, uh, uh, gave me the book Africa Adorned by Carol Beckwith and Angela Fisher, two white women. Um, all about, you know, they were anthropologists and, and uh, a photographer and they traveled all around Africa. And that was like this, I mean, it, the book was such a big influence on me and my sense of what objects could do, not even so much art, but what objects could do. And for me as someone who at that time was starting to work with metal and silver specifically, I was really thinking about the energy that metal transmitted and conducted and carried. And I always had this feeling as a teenager, as a young woman, that I wasn't involved enough, that I wasn't mature enough to work with gold. Like I knew that like silver was my metal forever. That was what I wore. That was the material that I worked with. And I had this sense of like, I have not earned the right to wear gold. Um, and I don't know, you know, fast forward many years, like a bunch of shit happened and I sort of got to this place where it was actually my grandmother who started giving me her gold jewelry as she, you know, was getting older and dying. And I think she, you know, was like thinking about her legacy. And I realized that I had achieved like a certain place in my life where I could wear gold and that gold was a material that connected me to my matrilineal line to the women on my father's side on the black side of my family and that it was a way for me to communicate with my ancestors and so it's always for me been a material that is about protection it's about adornment it's about beauty it's about the sun it's about um 
you know, it's about like or an origin story. It's about the cycles, like the sun and gold or are in a particular, you know, they get collapsed together often, right? This idea of sunshine and gold and promises and wealth and riches and all of that and reflection, right? Gold is very much about reflection. It's also an incredibly uh, gold, like pure gold is an incredibly soft metal. Um, so it speaks to strength in a way that we often, you know, we don't really think about softness as being a form of strength, gold right? Really that soft. that's a vulnerability that is also a strength. So those are all things that I'm interested. In. And with the gold leaf, you know, I usually use a mix of a pure gold leaf with what is called imitation gold leaf, which is usually copper and other materials. Um, so... I'm interested in those hierarchies also that gold presents us with in the same way that hair presents us with hierarchies of real hair, pure gold, imitation, fake, artificial, all of that. Like those are hierarchies that are based on Eurocentric, uh, based on Eurocentric aesthetics, right? That are held up to put down and to further marginalize black folks and specifically black women. So it's important to me to, to kind of um, like reappropriate that, to co-opt that back and to use gold in a way where it's like, I'm interested in sort of flipping that of where there is value and where there is power because there's a particular way that black women use gold and use hair, like I'm, I'm making a connection between those materials where, um, the value isn't dependent on the origin of the materials, right? So something being pure or this idea of authenticity, <clears throat> which is, I mean, that's like a whole nother topic, but this idea of authenticity and realness that is held up and used against us, I'm interested in flipping that back. And so, um, you know, that's part of the connection for me, but you know, gold things, black things are always going back to this idea of extractions and commodities of resources from Africa, going back to the scramble for Africa and European countries dividing up and creating borders where there weren't borders in Africa. And, uh, you know, so, so it really goes back to like the material that comes out of the ground, you know, that, that is actually exploded and bombed and extracted, um, you know, as like the, the, you know, mining industry has done just horrific things, you know, so that I carry that weight also as someone who loves metal and loves that material. I'm always thinking about that of how I participate in these systems at the same time, you know, and like, I love gold. I love diamonds. I do. Uh, and I also have to take the, on that responsibility of what that means to have those materials in my life, you know, and to participate in those systems. So I'm not, I'm not coming from a place of like criticizing or judging other folks on their materials. And even, you know, what Meryl said about using resin, like I, you know, I've gone, I've used resin before, like all of these materials that have really complex histories and biographies i think it's you know important for artists to be really attentive and to be really conscious about what it is we choose to bring into our studios and into our you know sometimes like i work at the kitchen table in my house with my kid in the next room so all of those histories are really important and they carry information and content and meaning for the work so i i really appreciate that question jamani you know specifically in terms of gold and the black female body, the African female body, you know, it's um, gold has, I think since the beginning been a material that black women, African women have adorned themselves with. Um, and so that, you know, there's a, uh, that, that alignment, that lineage is, uh, you know, it's really present, even though, you know, we're here in West Oakland on April 2nd, 2020. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank y'all so much. That was so powerful um, and really resonated with me, particularly points around just, yeah, reclaiming that right to use and wear gold and adorn ourselves right? and uh, just reclaiming that sense of power 
um, that's and, and royalty, right? That's constantly beaten out of us by capitalism and patriarchy and a black and, and really reclaiming that protection, like you said, from our ancestors, right? Um, I have one more question. Um, it's a little bit more in the day. <laughs> But yeah, can you can you talk about the the duality of the hyper visibility and invisibility of black women in relationship to COVID? Um, and then a follow up question to that is, um, yeah, like would you have added anything to this had you created it yesterday, for example? Um, just considering, yeah, the things that are coming up around how black women are impacted by COVID. Mm. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't know if, I don't know how long you've been on this uh, webinar. Um, when we came on, we, we talked a little bit about um, uh, the title of We Matter uh, by Adrian and Who Matters. And in, um, right now, these times during COVID-19, we are seeing um, the people that we didn't even want to pay $15 an hour um, who do matter and the majority of those people are black women um, who are not even being spoke, um, spoke of in the media during, yeah, during, during this um, pandemic, this global pandemic and um, from personal just like speaking to your question, Angela and I went to Target in Emeryville the other day and um, you know, here we are masked up, gloved up and everything, getting ready to go get some essentials to be sheltered in place. And as we are entering this Target in Emeryville, this black woman truck driver for, I think, the, uh, Lay's, Doritos, the, the chip company, is driving out of the Target parking lot. And as she's driving out, no mask, no gloves, and she's handing um, some unhoused folks in the West Oakland neighborhood chips from the truck mm -hmm. and <clears throat> you know i haven't seen anyone else during this pandemic in my neighborhood of west oakland um i'm from here as i stated when i came on my parents were black panthers so i understand the history of this neighborhood very well and to see that this this black woman truck driver um passing out out of deliver from delivering you know the necessary shipment to target these unhoused folks on the street, un just letting down the window and passing them food. It was like, um, it's just very much speaking to the question you asked about the duality of the hyper visibility of black women being invisibilized in, in workplace. And, and during this pandemic, it's like, um, Oftentimes, you know, these stereotypes and these tropes of black women as being aggressive and angry and upset and loud, especially dark skinned black women, um, they're seen. And then all those stereotypes become uh, ascribed to, to these black women that, you know, the first thing you see or hear are all these things that have been, you know, stereotyped. But then here it is, you know, we're, we're going into this Target and this black woman driving this truck is passing out food. Mm -hmm. And where is that highlight of her work mm -hmm. during this pandemic right now? And what she's doing for the community right now? And why is that not hyper invisibilized like the other negative stereotypes that are often um, magnified socially um, in our country and, mm -hmm. uh, and globally? Um, it's... You know, it's very hard to digest. And I think we would have probably done a few things differently if we did this yesterday. And even before, um, unfortunately, Brock had to make the conscious decision to not have this gallery open for the opening. You know, we were questioning, you know, what was going on or why we couldn't have the opening. And it was just, you know, a lot of things probably, yeah, would have been different considering um, one and thing, again, appreciate that question. One thing that popped into my mind, you know, if we were doing this while well yesterday, the first thing that popped in my mind was see black women work, which, you know, kind of speaks to the story that T was, was telling and sharing. Um, and, 
you know, I think so often we collectively, you know, non-black folks and black folks, we rely on the labor of black women without even recognizing that labor, recognizing the history of that labor. And then the other phrase that popped into my mind, which is like kind of heartbreaking to say, but what popped into my mind was see black women die. Because mm-hmm. I think also when we start to, you know, when there starts to be more analysis of the people who are dying from coronavirus, I think it's going to be really, really important to look at the demographics and to look at the, the you know, racial, uh, to look at the, the racialization of the coronavirus, which has already kind of, you know, yeah. happened with the president, you know, calling this the Chinese virus, right? So that was sort of one aspect of it that was very mm-hmm. blatant and very mm-hmm. explicit. Um, but I think mm-hmm. when we start to look at the numbers of who's actually dying, because that then speaks to these larger systems of racism and marginalization, like who has access to healthcare and who's going to be let into the hospital, you know, if a respirator is available, who's that respirator going to go to? We already know there have been so many studies that have come out in the last few years about the difference between when like black women go to the doctor and when white women go to the doctor and, and the kind of care and the kind pain of care tolerance, is, yeah. all of these things that are based on mythologies of decide. blackness and whether we feel pain. pain or not. Right. right. So that is going to play out, you know, in the demographics and the mortality yeah. rates of who's, di- who's dying. And it already has. I mean, literally you look at Louisiana right now, New Orleans, you know, I'm a survivor of Hurricane yeah. Katrina and it's, um, you know, it's like I see what was happening during Hurricane, Hurricane Katrina happening right now in which Louisiana, New Orleans specifically in that state is going to be the most um, hardest hit exponentially with um, deaths per day as we hit this peak in the pandemic. Um, and it's just about who gets to be thrown away and who is a throwaway person. You know what I mean? So, yeah, very much appreciate that question and highlighting um, our current uh, global pandemic. Appreciate, appreciate that. Thanks, Jamali. Thank you. Um, I also want to just kind of input what Angela was saying about gold. I love how you speak about metal and all of its meaning and um, just its experience through living through the lives of a variety of people and cultures throughout history. It really um, has so many complex meanings. The other thing about gold is that it does not tarnish, um, which is what is sort of like ascribed its value over time. I think people have been drawn to it because it doesn't tarnish, it doesn't oxidize, and it doesn't experience fire scale. Um, So that's also a really interesting aspect of gold, but... (laughs) This would be a good segue to talk about how, in general, we can support the community. The-